All right, welcome to uh, the Marketplace uh, session about Gluon. We're going to talk today about uh, why and what it is. So why is Gluon needed? So my name is uh, Toby Ford, and I work at AT&T, and uh, my partner here, Ben Hu, he also works at AT&T. So we're a little biased toward the NFV workloads, but uh, I believe what we're going to talk about is applicable even broader than that. Certainly, the impetus to do Gluon came from the NFV space and what we're having to deal with. So at a, at a very simple level, the difference between an enterprise or a public cloud or a typical cloud environment to what we're doing is that typically the clouds that had been built before were ones that were endpoint oriented. Uh, whereas what we're building has a lot to do with uh, moving packets from one place to another and uh, processing those packets as they go. Certainly the cloud had been doing that, but not at the scale or at the distribution that we're talking about. So in a specific cases, when we think of uh, networking, we often talk about the OSI model, layer two, layer three, and such. Uh, in a data center, you know, in a cloud data centers that we built before, often that, that boundary was at the edge of the building. So we did a lot of L2 stuff in the building, and then we sent it to routers, and routers would deal with the WAN and whatever was happening. In, a, in our implementation of NFV, we've shifted that boundary. Uh, where does that L3 happen? And we've moved that into uh, possibly into the VNF itself, into the VM, or into the hypervisor, or in the container management scheme, move it all the way into that layer. And we did that because, in our belief, is that uh, in order to scale and to provide the same reservation and separation end-to-end -end from one building to another, from your house to our data center, from your house to, let's say, uh, Sony's content management system, we want to make sure we can provide consistent connectivity and, again, separation and reservation. So when we've tried to implement this concept in OpenStack uh, and with Neutron, you know, we, we got made some progress, and then not only us, but others in the space, Orange and such, uh, have made progress in making uh, what the way that we think of networking and our use cases map to Neutron and kind of contort Neutron to our needs. But it's as we've gone along and tried to increase the number of use cases and increase the, you know, the sort of creative ways that we're doing networking, it's starting to show some issues. And it, one of the issues is a central concept of getting, trying to get to a standard API and you know, convince that there's only a simple API that can define networking versus one that is extensible enough to even to the point where if I made a new service tomorrow, that the networking API would change. And that's really not what, uh, what is intended by the, the networking design in, in OpenStack today. So, um, so beyond that, even if I extend and I keep going in that direction, I want to make it so that when I do make that API, a multitude of vendors and backends can actually service it, very much like ML2 does today, but, but even broader. And even broader in that, it's not just about moving the packets, it's also about processing them. And this is where service function chaining comes in. And service function chaining also has the same dynamic of, in some models, it's L2 oriented, in others, it's L3 oriented. Unfortunately, the existing implementation of, of SFC in Neutron is very L2 oriented. So this is an example where, you know, we want more flexibility and more extensibility. So this is, in, in many other dimensions, uh, you know, if we think of networking changing, just if we look at the attack that happened last week, it's inevitable that networking is going to evolve in, in new ways with regard to encryption or authorization, whether it's me being authorized or a token, or if it's going to be content-based routing, whatever it is, it's going to evolve. So we have to make an environment uh, networking scheme that uh, evolves along with these changes. And our, our view is that uh, you know, we wanted to test this area and try to come up with a way to make it work um, that allowed to meet, us, meet our needs. So we created this Gluon project. 
And it, some of the side effects after the fact, we didn't really go into it thinking this, but some of the side effects that we've, we've realized and our benefits of Gluon as well are about how it's possible to uh, change out networking constructs, have multiple, more than two, network constructs, SDN controller, uh, data plane combinations, um, have different versions, have them all within one environment and be able to maintain that and keep the VMs running and change them between network constructs. So an additional benefit came along from this, this work. So we didn't really intend necessarily to replace Neutron, just demonstrate what's possible and then over time figure out a, a, an appropriate place to integrate. So I'll, I'll pass it to now to, to uh, Ben to, for him to describe what it, what it is. Thank you, Toby. Um, so let me give a brief overview of the high-level design of Gluon. And the Gluon basically composed of two major components. One is the Gluon framework, which includes a particle generator. And Gluon maintains the mapping of a port and a different backends in the database and forward the port-related request and to the correct backend. And the second component of, the Proton, uh, of Gluon is called Proton. So basically, that's a networking APIs, and we give the name of Proton. So different type of networking APIs are different Protons. And the how Proton was generated is that the networking services was modeled in the model file. So now we implemented the model in the YAML file. But the, it really doesn't matter which type of the model and we are using. For example, we may also use a YAM model. We can also use a Tosca model or different type of model. The key concept here is a model, right? And the actual model that models the actual networking services. And the Gluon framework has a component also called a particle generator. The particle generator will read the YAML file and generate the API endpoints and the database schema and for the, for the uh, APIs and the services itself. And so the only requirement here is a concept of port. And so that the uh, compute services right, can request and start virtual machines and bind a port to the different backends and with those networking services. And uh, so that gives the flexibility and extendability of the uh, new networking APIs and based on the uh, model and that's be um, created at design time and also executing those the, uh, services at the execution time. And of course, it's the uh, concept of the high-level architecture design, and that it may be implemented in different ways. And so we have implemented uh, the proof concept four months ago and uh, in the OpenV Summit. And so here, the picture gives the implementation at that time. And that time, we implemented Gluon as a standalone uh, server. And the server will be basically be configured as a network API class and, uh, and work with Nova directly. And the Gluon server has a logic to determine whether or not the port is from um, the uh, Proton or the port is from Neutron. And then if the port is from the Proton and it gives back uh, the port binding request to the different network APIs in the Proton part, and the Proton will work with the different engine controllers at back end. If the port is a regular Neutron port and it just gives the port to Neutron and the Neutron will handle it in its conventional way so that all the happy users will be happy. And so you can see from the uh, typical the workflow perspective, right, and that prerequisite the users will be able to find those API endpoints through, for example, the Keystone or some other uh, service discovery uh, mechanism. And then the users will be able to use the uh, protons or the neutrons to create the port and the networking services. And then the user will be able to uh, launch the virtual machines and with the port as a parameter. And Nova will talk to the glue one and uh, give the port uh, information and uh, so that Gluon will handle those ports respectively, whether or not it's be handled by the Proton and its backend or by the Neutron in the regular way. And uh, um, for the Neto API class in the Nova was deprecated and because of the uh, interoperability concerns and the deprecating of the Nova uh, networking part. And so for this, the uh, op uh, OpenStack Summit, and we implemented it in the temporarily using the neutron plugin uh, method. So basically, we extended uh, subclassing the uh, ML2 plugin um, class, 
and we uh, create a dummy network and subnets and for the port creation, and we're also using the separate database and from the uh, Neutron's database. And the extended code for the uh, last wrap is the, uh, the, the core plugin will be able to determine whether or not the port is for the Gluon port or it's a regular the, uh, uh, the uh, Neutron port. If the Gluon port, it will give back to the Proton server and let the Proton handle that and with the network in the uh, backend different ATM controllers. And if it's a regular, the uh, Neutron port, back to the, uh, the regular the core uh, plugin and uh, let L2 agent handle it. So that's we, how we uh, implemented at this time. And uh, the Gluon, of course, Gluon plugin wrappers will uh, have the port arbiter functions and the Proton servers, the API server, and the shim layers will handle all the different DSD controllers configurations and make sure that all the backends will interoperate with each other and will handle um, all the uh, related functions and uh, at the backend and it can support the different types of DSD controllers as well. Um, so the, here's an example about the uh, model that we um, of those APIs and uh, in the YAML file. And so we use the uh, L3 the VPN as example, and you can see that the, uh, the any network services can be modeled in this way and can be read by the particle generator in order to generate the address for API endpoints and uh, validate these endpoints and the database schema and the backend communication method and uh, um, and uh, store those informations in the etcd. Of course. And uh, um, the model here, the key word is a model. It doesn't have to be in the YAML, right? And as long as we have tool and we can be modeled in the Yang, we can be modeled in the Tosca or different type of modeling the um, languages and uh, uh, models, right? And so that's kind of uh, flexible. Uh, in the back end, and uh, the Proton will be able to communicate to different the SDN controllers through the ETCD and using the pop up model. Right, and uh, so it's a distributed key value store in the ETCD, and the shim layer will listen to the update and from the Proton server and be able to act upon those requests accordingly and uh, work with the different SDN controllers. So the benefits you need a need of the plugins and supports multiple SDN controllers at back end, and so any SDN controllers can be plugged into the uh, 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 the picture at the, at the runtime and just listen to the uh, ETCD for the uh, different the updates and uh, at the ETCD side. And also the model is a key value, so the, uh, any kind of the JSON model can be supported and as a value of the uh, 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 models in the ETCD database. So the main benefits, more simplicity. So individual API endpoints, um, it's uh, much simpler because they only have to do one thing, right, and uh, one backend. If SDN controller A is good at doing the uh, service A, SDN controller B is good at doing service B, and they can do it in, the, it's, uh, in its own way and in a much simpler way. And the more choices, right? And uh, I don't have to find the uh, one tool that fits everything I want. And I choose the tool that best fits my need for this particular service, right? More innovation, right? And uh, we can have them um, basically unlimited innovation of new networking services and uh, to be created at design time and to be launched and quickly launched and uh, deployed to our customers and uh, we fail fast, right? And that as an agile method, and to enable new use cases in the telco market, and to serve us customers in a more um, elegant way and uh, in a more rapid way, and accelerate time to market of launching the new services to our uh, telco customers. And uh, so, Toby will be yeah. wrapping so up the uh, the talk. Yeah. So then. Uh We've actually worked very closely with uh, a number of vendors. Uh, it's a rare opportunity to actually have, uh, what do we have, Juniper, Ericsson, Nokia, Cisco, and now Huawei, uh, all helping us to make Gluon work. Uh, so if you search around here, uh, at least three of them have a demonstration of, of Gluon, as well as at our booth, we have a, a demonstration of, of what uh, Gluon looks like. Um, so. I think this is a good example of a group of community members working together to actually make something work. Now the real trick is how do we take it to the next step and uh, make, it, make it real uh, and make it implemented in a, in a release of OpenStack. All right, so I'd uh, like to ask uh, if, if there's any questions about this and uh, feel free. Don't want to get in your way between uh, whatever you have coming next. Any questions? All right. Thank you very much. Oh, w w hey. How's this really going? Does it have a chance? Are you going to make it? 
So right today, uh, what you want to talk about that is what, where is it now in terms of being an ML2 plugin, or wh where is it yeah. in the uh, process? Yeah, so we are working and actively working with uh, uh, Nova team, the Neutron team, and to determine what's the best approach and to move forward in terms of working and uh, integrating with OpenStack. And uh, so um, we have different implementations, and uh, both implementations uh, um, proved to be practical and to be working, and uh, we wanted to do it in the uh, right way ultimately and have the right architecture and uh, moving forward and ultimately benefit the OpenStack and the whole ecosystem. <laughs> yeah, so we need more supporters from the community, right? And this will support us to work within the OpenStack community. Hey, security, can, can you get this guy out of here? <laughs> the heckler. All right, thank you, everybody. Uh, have a good evening. Thank you. <laughs>